Hey there. Um, if you followed along with us in the previous presentation, you know that John F. Kennedy was not exactly um, really enthusiastic about civil rights. He didn't even really see himself as a potential civil rights president. Uh, however, because there's going to be events, institutions, and, and even individuals that are going to uh, implement um, measures that are specifically designed to bring more of a federal presence into this realm of civil rights, ultimately in the end Kennedy is going to be forced to choose sides and, and, in, and in the end he's going, to, he's going to ultimately choose sides with the movement. One of those individuals that I want you to be mindful of would be a woman by the name of Ella Baker who was directly involved in civil rights. Uh, she very much admired the work that was being done by the NAACP, the work being done by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. This was all good work, but she was also simultaneously critical of what she referred to as the professional organizing of the civil rights movement. In other words, in her mind, um, the, the movement needed to do two things. Number one, it needed more direct militant action. You gotta force the issue with these people, uh, the establishment that is. That was the opinion of Ella Baker. And the other thing that the movement needed to become was younger. We needed more young people that were dedicated to the cause of civil rights. We needed those people involved and we needed to hear their voices. Now, that opinion was so central in her decision to ultimately hold this Southern-wide Youth Leadership Conference at Shaw University uh, one Easter weekend. Now, what comes out of this conference is a very important civil rights organization that will come to be known as the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, SNCC. Now, the purpose of SNCC is really twofold. One, it is designed to expand that realm of, of direct militant action. You're going to see this directly here in a moment with the sit-in movement. The other thing that it's trying to do, and you'll see it both here today and a little bit later in our semester, but it's also attempting to register more and more people to vote. We need to change the dynamics of politics, and that means we need to get more people involved in the political process, generally speaking. There's one other thing that I want you to understand about SNCC. It is an interracial organization, at least initially it is. It consists of African American activists, but it also consists of white people that are dedicated to the prospects of integrating American life broadly defined. SNCC is involved in a number of different direct action forms of activism. Uh, but probably the most famous, and certainly the, the, the issue that's come most uh, clearly to historians, would be the role that it played in the sit-in movement. Uh, you might remember what I'm talking about from a few lectures ago. Uh, the movement in places like Woolworth's Five and Dime shops in Greensboro, North Carolina, or Nashville, Tennessee, where African-American uh, young people dressed themselves in their Sunday bests and they uh, sat down at the lunch counter and they refused to leave until they were served lunch. This is the brand of civil rights activism that SNCC is going to get involved in in the early 1960s. And uh, if you recall from that lecture a few, a few days ago, uh, what the sit-ins did is they provoked violence. The students themselves had trained very, 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 very diligently in the art of passive resistance, non-violent resistance. And what we saw happen is, is, is violence that was directed at the demonstrators. They're sitting at the lunch counters. All they're trying to do is exercise their, uh, their, their constitutionally backed rights. And it was these hoodlums that came out and, 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 and cracked their heads and ripped off their clothes and the police that arrested them for, for, for de basically demonstrating peacefully. This is going to really put the Kennedy administration on the defensive. Understand, it's one thing to kind of look the other way when you see a whites-only sign on a bathroom door, 
uh, not good, but certainly not necessarily something that's going to bring you into the movement. But when you have young people that are being beaten up badly, and more importantly, you've got television crews that are capturing all of this on film, and they're beaming it into American living rooms around 6 o'clock on the news in middle America, that is really not good for business if you happen to be the chief officer of the executive branch of government. If your job is to enforce the law, you got some work to do, according to SNCC. So as you can see, the activism sponsored by SNCC is going to really force Kennedy's hand when it comes to becoming more involved in civil rights. Another civil rights organization that I want you to be mindful of, um, it actually got its start much earlier than uh, SNCC did. The Congress on Racial Equality was founded in uh, the 1940s by a guy by the name of James Farmer, African-American civil rights activist that establishes what would come to be known as CORE, uh, to, to invite anybody who believed in equality, racial equality, broadly defined, to become involved in this institution. Well, from the 1940s into the early 1960s, uh, for lack of a better way of putting this, CORE had kind of taken a back seat to many of these new and uh, uh, great civil rights organizations like SNCC. What it needed to do is it needed to find some new cause to get behind, to, to bring attention back on it, but more importantly, focus America's attention on why reform in the, in the realm of racial relations is, is so vitally necessary. What they found was interstate travel. A few years before 1961, um, the Supreme Court had basically said that it was illegal to, to practice the form of segregation um, that was seen every day in interstate travel. Busing is what I'm generally talking about, okay? It was illegal to have separate restrooms, it was illegal to have a seating chart based on race, but all of these things were, 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 were on full display in, in any part of the South and certainly even outside of the South in certain realms of American life. And so what CORE is going to design, guys, is, is going to come to be known as the Freedom Rides. I'll come back to this slide here in a second, but if you look at my map following along on the uh, PowerPoint presentation with me, the Freedom Rides are going to begin in Washington, D.C. They're going to travel all throughout the South, cut right across the state of Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and, and, and eventually, a few weeks later, end in New Orleans, end in the Deep South. And all along the way, what they were going to do is, is really bring public attention through direct militant activism uh, as far as enforcing the letter of this Supreme Court decision that said segregation was illegal in interstate travel. Um, every white person sat next to a black person on the bus. Uh, when the bus would stop at one of these stations, all the white people would wait in the uh, colored-only waiting section. The African-American people would go use the restrooms, even though they said whites only. And obviously, this is going to provoke a reaction. And the reaction that it's going to provoke is really going to come full circle once they hit Alabama. In particular, Addiston, Alabama is going to be a site that would, would eventually live in infamy in the, in the civil rights movement's history. That bus that you're looking at right there had been surrounded by the Ku Klux Klan, who had gotten word that the Freedom Riders were coming through their neck of the woods. They drove the bus off the, off the, um, off the highway, surrounded it, broke out its back window and began tossing Molotov cocktails in. Everybody on the bus, as you can see, was, was forced out. And when they, uh, when they went out, that they, they, they were at the mercy of the Klan, who beat the ever-loving daylights out of these people. Now, again, keep in mind, you've got not only television crews, but also photographers and journalists from all across the country that are capturing all of this, and they're disseminating it in the form of news. And once again, the Freedom Rides are really forcing the Kennedy administration to, uh, to act. What the Kennedy administration is saying to states like Alabama, like Mississippi, if you cannot protect 
these interstate travelers understand that basically what you're talking about is a federal issue. It's my job to enforce the law when it comes to interstate travel. If the Alabama Highway Patrol can't get this done, let me know and I'd be glad to federalize these actions when it comes to that. But again, what CORE and the Freedom Rides are going to do is really put the Kennedy administration on the defensive and ultimately get them to choose sides. Another individual that's putting a lot of pressure on the establishment is going to be this young uh, SNCC official, uh, foreign born, but ultimately he called the Bronx, New York home, um, a guy by the name of Stokely Carmichael. Carmichael was one of these freedom riders that I was just telling you about. And, uh, you know, wh whereas it was violence that the state of Alabama practiced to, shall we say, discourage, um, these activists from continuing on, it was the threat of imprisonment that the state of Mississippi used to kind of detract from the uh, organizing, or from this direct action. In particular, they knew that the image of a southern uh, prisoner chain gang, right, uh, and, and the absolutely deplorable conditions of southern, uh, uh, southern prisons, especially when it comes to people of the African-American variety, um, that, that that would be a very, very vibrant deterrent when it comes to stopping this civil rights direct action. And Carmichael is going to be one of these individuals that would press on after Aniston, make his way through Mississippi, ultimately arrested, and, and he's going to serve hard time in Parchment State Prison Farm. He's going to be out there on that chain gang. And once again, this, this, is, this is very, very public, and it's bringing more and more attention on this issue of civil rights, and it's bringing more and more uh, 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 pressure on the Kennedy administration to get involved here. Stokely Carmichael is also a bit problematic to the tactics of Martin Luther King. You might say that, in a way, he's, he's putting on pressure on MLK, to up his ante when it comes to direct militant activism. Um, you're going to see this come home in, in 1963. And in 1963, Martin Luther King is really going to be looking for some example that he can set forward, some example that is going to be absolutely critical to the Kennedy administration getting involved in civil rights. And originally he thought he had it in Albany, Georgia. Albany is going to be one of the great defeats of MLK's civil rights movement. And what he's going to do is he's going to attempt to protest segregation policies in Albany, Georgia. He'll be arrested for it, but the sheriff of Albany had read much of MLK, MLK's writing. And, and I think he really understood this whole idea of passive resistance and the whole idea that you, when you respond with violence, that was problematic for your cause if you wanted to maintain the uh, racist social order. So he basically lets King out of jail. And what that forces King to do is go back to the drawing board. The example of Albany did not work. He needed a better example. Let me tell you something. Nowhere, anywhere in all of the United States was there a better example than Birmingham, Alabama. King described Birmingham as the most segregated city in all of America. Um, it, it very well could have been. More importantly, it, 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 was, it was ran, or at least its law enforcement branch was ran, by one of the most bigoted racists in, in all of American history, uh, the commissioner of public safety, a guy by the name of Eugene Bull Connor. Connor really saw enforcement of segregation as his life's work, and, and he went about it with, uh, with the zeal of a religious zealot. Martin Luther King is going to target Birmingham, and he's going to target the community by proclaiming that African Americans should not continue to shop, spend money, where they could not work or they could not use the restrooms. Don't shop where they will not e allow you to use their restroom facilities, and don't shop in a place where they profit from black dollars, but they don't hire any black workers.
The other thing that King is really going to do that's going to make a big difference here would, would be make a conscious decision to allow women and children to participate in this march in Birmingham in 1963. Bull Connor is going to unleash fire hoses, high-powered fire hoses, that they're so powerful uh, they could punch a, a brick out of a brick building. They would pick people up and slam them against the walls. He unleashed these police dogs, as you can see, if you're following along with me, that would shred people's clothing. And once again, all of this is being beamed into American living rooms via TV. Eventually, MLK is going to be arrested for protesting without a permit. And while he's in jail in Birmingham, he's going to take a lot of criticism from the white clergy, from the white religious community who condemned his action, saying that he was irresponsible, that he knew that this kind of activity in a place like Birmingham was only going to result in violence. And they encouraged him to be patient, something to the effect of Rome wasn't built in a day. King thought long and hard about the reaction of the white religious community. And ultimately, this is going to be his influence when it comes to writing maybe the most important document, most famous document of all the civil rights movement's history, his letter from the Birmingham jail. And what he says in that document is, if you are haunted by day and by night, that you are, in fact, an African American. And by definition, you are a second or even third class citizen. And there are just certain things that you're just not good enough to do, then you will find it easy to understand why we find it so hard to wait. We've only been waiting for the better part of 300 years. We're tired of waiting. We need change now. That's essentially what the letter from the Birmingham jail is proclaiming. Change and change now. And just like everything else that I've mentioned, what Birmingham does, what the letter from the Birmingham jail does, is it puts an enormous amount of pressure on John F. Kennedy. One last caveat when it comes to this issue of pressure and Kennedy's ultimate inspiration for getting involved in the civil rights movement. I want to talk to you a little bit about a guy from Omaha, Nebraska by the name of Malcolm Little. Little was the son of a Baptist reverend by the name of Earl Little, who was a very avid follower of Marcus Garvey and Garveyism. And if you recall from the 1920s, Garveyism was not only um, a very assertive, very militant brand of civil rights activism, it was also a form of black separation, completely separate from the white race. Okay. Um, one of the groups that did not appreciate the preaching and the brand of Christianity that uh, Earl Little was preaching in Omaha was none other than the Black Legion, who's ultimately going to drive the Littles out of, um, out of Nebraska, and they will take up Lansing, Michigan as their new home city. And it's in Lansing that the Ku Klux Klan are going to assassinate Reverend Little. Um, my point in telling you all of this is that from the perspective of Malcolm Little, his entire childhood had been drenched in racial violence. That's all he had ever known. As far as his affiliation and association with white people, it was only ever really in a violent sort of context. In the aftermath of his father dying, his mother was in charge of the entire um, um, household. And ultimately, she's put in, in an almost impossible task in that, Malcolm is really going to get into trouble from an early age. He's going to become a petty thief. Later on, he will become a drug dealer. And, and, and ultimately, he's going to do hard time in a federal penitentiary in Massachusetts. He's arrested for burglary. And it's in prison that he, that he converts to Islam, primarily because it's the nation of Islam that really changes his attitude when it comes to what, what his life's work needs to be. Now, for your notes, guys, what the Nation of Islam is, is probably the leading institution that's advocating black separation at this particular moment. 
mid-1950s, early 1960s. It's led by a guy by the name of Elijah Muhammad, and very similar to Marcus Garvey in the 1920s, he's quite clear in terms of we cannot wait for integration, we need self-sufficiency, we need to separate from uh, white America altogether. Malcolm X is going to, uh, well, first of all, um, uh, Malcolm Little will drop his last name of Little, proclaiming it to be the name that was uh, uh, forced upon his ancestors by their slave captors. What he wanted was a Muslim name. Um, Elijah Muhammad never really gave him one of those. So for the time being, he adopted the name Malcolm X, the civil rights leader, Malcolm X. And he's also going to begin to start preaching a very fiery and apocalyptic brand of Islam. He's going to be recruited by the Nation of Islam, but there's going to be an unmistakable civil rights element to his stewardship in, in, in this institution of Islam. He not only preaches black separatism and, and self-sufficiency, self-determination for the black community, he also proclaims that if somebody of the white variety is violent toward you, you make sure that they're not violent toward anybody else. He was insinuating, we, we will protect black lives by any means necessary. This whole idea preached by some of these southern black ministers, and he didn't name names, but clearly he's talking about MLK, um, turning the other cheek, we don't turn our cheeks. This was a very different vision of African-American protest, similar to that new Negro racial assertiveness that we saw with the race riots in World War I and World War II, Malcolm X and the brand of civil rights activism that he's preaching is very, very different and very scary to the establishment. It's one thing to talk the talk, but it's quite something different to walk the walk. And in the early 1960s, X is going to get that, that opportunity to, to, in fact, walk the walk. One of the individuals that is going to be a card-carrying member of not only the nation, but the mosque in which Malcolm X preached, Mosque Number 7 in Harlem, is a guy by the name of Johnson Hinton. And on one particular night, Hinton had gone missing. He was out doing some work for the nation. And uh, he just never came home. And pretty quickly, word got back to Mosque Number 7 that uh, the New York Police Department had not only arrested him, but they'd beat him up pretty good. And uh, there's a lot of pressure on Malcolm X to go and to put his money where his mouth was when it comes to demanding the release of Johnson Hinton. So X goes down to the uh, police station and he asks to see Johnson Hinton to make sure that he's okay, that he doesn't need to see a doctor. The police department basically gives him the runaround, very condescending, and tells him to go home. It's at that point that Malcolm X invites the NYPD to look out their window. And what these police officers quickly see is that there were three or four rings deep of Nation of Islam activists that had surrounded the police station. Now, they didn't say release him or else, but they were pretty open-ended, pretty vague in terms of what might happen next if they were not allowed to see their colleague. And in the end, the NYPD allowed Malcolm X to see Johnson Hinton, and it was a very good thing that he did, primarily because he was bleeding badly. Malcolm X was able to get a doctor, and he insisted on it being an African-American doctor, who put things right from Johnson Hinton, and this has a happy ending. But more importantly, what, what, what Malcolm X is, is basically demonstrating here is Martin Luther King is not the only game in town, right? And uh, from the perspective of the white community and the political establishment, what he's doing is he's giving it a choice. You want to deal with him, you want to deal with me. Martin, Malcolm, Malcolm Martin, who would you rather deal with? And in a lot of ways, the establishment says, I think we're going to go with Martin, right? To put it bluntly, what Malcolm X, the Nation of Islam, and that brand of civil rights activism did is it scared the daylights out of the establishment and it put an enormous amount of pressure on the Kennedy administration. Kennedy does not want to get involved in civil rights for the very specific reason that he cannot afford to sacrifice the American South. 
Keep in mind, he was elected president in 1960 by the narrowest of margins, and, and, and the, the South went a different direction, or even if it sat it out, that was really going to be a problem in terms of 1964. We've seen them do this. In 1948, when Harry Truman said that we were going to get serious about uh, civil rights, uh, you saw the establishment of a third independent party calling themselves the Dixiecrats. And all across the deep south, Alabama, Mississippi, they didn't vote for Truman in, in 1948. You also saw states like Virginia that were entirely defiant of the Brown versus Board of Education decision and not only refused to comply with it, but began inventing, I'm going to put it politely, sneaky ways to reestablish white-only schools. We've also talked about the individual that you're looking at on that PowerPoint uh, presentation right there, James Meredith and the University of Mississippi. I know that you know that... Um, Medgar Evers was very instrumental in not only pressuring Mississippi, but guiding uh, James Meredith to eventually break the color line at that institution. It's, it's JFK that ultimately provides the final straw. This is, this is Kennedy getting serious about civil rights. Um, what the governor of Mississippi pretty much told Kennedy was, you, you can't force my hand in this issue. And John F. Kennedy said, yes, I can, right? Because if you don't uh, begin to take a more proactive look at who you're in, enrolling here, if you don't open the door to all comers, including people of the African-American variety, uh, you're not going to the Rose Bowl this year. I know it's hard to believe if you look at the University of Mississippi today uh, and its football program today, but once upon a time it was a powerhouse in, 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 in college football. And what Kennedy said was, I'm going to shut you down and you're not going to go to the Rose Bowl. You're not going to go to any bowl unless you begin to get serious about integration. And that's ultimately going to be the final straw here. But at the same time, guys, you have other governors, um, some for principle and some because it was really good for votes. Uh, people like George Wallace that said, you'll never, in, uh, you'll, you'll never integrate the University of Alabama. You're not going to do to me what you've done to, uh, uh, to, to, uh, Mississippi, even if I have to stand in the doorway to prevent you from doing it, which ultimately he did. What Kennedy's going to do on the same night that George Wallace actually stands in the doorway of the administration building of the University of Alabama and refuse to allow four black students to integrate that school, is Kennedy goes on national television and he addresses the nation. And basically what he says is, we've got this dilemma that's as old as time, and ultimately what it, what it, what it comes down to is, are we going to treat our fellow Americans as we would like to be treated? What historians have typically seen this speech as is Kennedy getting serious, Kennedy finally cracking and getting involved directly in civil rights. Other individuals are going to call this the Second Emancipation Proclamation. If you recall from early American history, what the First Emancipation Proclamation does is it sets the slaves in parts of the South free. What this second one does, it's more metaphoric than it is literal, is it demonstrates that the, civil, that the federal government is going to become very involved in the civil rights movement. What Kennedy is outlining here is sweeping plans for civil rights reform. But understand something. This is not some liberal, benevolent politician doing the uh, right thing. This is the result. This is the accomplishment of massive amounts of grassroots protesting. Civil rights activists like Diane Nash, like Ella Baker, like Jim Swerve, like Stokely Carmichael, like Malcolm X, like Martin Luther King, out there pounding the pavement, risking life and limb to force the Kennedy administration to get involved. Believe me, they would have avoided it had they thought that they would have been able to get away with it. What you're looking at there, guys, would be what most people would have considered the high point of the civil rights movement. In 1963, Martin Luther King is going to give his I Have a Dream speech. And this Million Man March on Washington is going to be really the result of the organizing attempts of an SCLC worker by the name of Bayard Rustin. Uh, 
Rustin doesn't get nearly enough credit in American history for the work that he's done for social justice, and freedom, and equality. Later on, um, after he came out as a homosexual, uh, he's going to do a lot of good work for uh, the equality of um, people of sexual orientations as well. But for right now, it's Baird Rustin that, that does a lot of the heavy lifting to get this March on Washington um, off the ground. And King gives his I Have a Dream speech. And when I say that this is the high point of the movement, I think what we mean here is that if you polled most Americans, most Americans would have been highly supportive of, of, of getting serious as far as providing civil rights reform. Okay, 1963 is when the movement is going to crest. Public opinion is behind the movement. So too is the Kennedy administration. But a combination of numerous different things. Uh, one, the assassination of John F. Kennedy. We don't entirely know what his plan for civil rights would have looked like, considering he's not around to give it. And two, the radicalization of the civil rights movement, people becoming increasingly frustrated in the slow pace of progress. That's going to isolate supporters and uh, lower public opinion. And three, the muddying of the waters. And of course, that mud would have come in Southeast Asia in the war in Vietnam. You'll see what I mean once we get to that point in the semester. For right now, guys, I'll see you later.